Blue, so we're going to click it. And we're live. It is Wednesday, 5 o'clock p.m. September 15th, 2021, the Ides of September, or as it is sometimes known, Era of Yom Kippur, the day it will be inscribed in the Book of Life, whether you are going to be eaten by beasts this year. I always think we bury the lead on Yom Kippur, um, but uh, just a word on this. It is probably 8th century text, um, but uh, I think the technical term is freaking old, and it says it's part of the liturgy of Yom Kippur. On Rosh Hashanah, it is written, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. Who shall live and who shall die? Who will be born and who will pass away? Who in good time and who by an untimely death? Who by water, which is to say by drowning? Who by fire? Who by sword? And who by wild beast? It goes on. It gets even more grisly. But I just want to say the inclusion of the wild beast there always struck me as an inspired addition. Um, <laughs> you know, you just don't want to leave it out. And so I read a story in uh, the Hill newspaper about an alligator that they cut open uh, in the floodwaters of Hurricane Ida and found in it human remains. And I thought that was inscribed last year <laughs> on Yom Kippur. So if, if you're going to be eaten by a wild beast this year, it is being like sealed today or tomorrow, as the case yeah. may be. Like, so yeah, take like, it seriously, people. Well, yeah, take it seriously, because like, especially if you're a fabricator. No. Um, that's right. If, yeah, if you're a fabricator, it, it, um, it that's like the worst thing. It's transgressed a lot in the last year, or right. months, there, or year, decades. So yeah, so it's, 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 a, a, it's a really, occasion. it's a very serious thing um, not to fabricate. We really want to have humanity. And I just um, want to say about this, you know, that um, I have never really thought of being eaten by a wild beast as punishment for transgressions and, you know, particularly academic transgressions in previous years. But um, every year on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I am reminded that there is a karmic relationship between your behavior and your likelihood of being eaten by wild beasts. <laughs> As somebody who goes outside, works on my uh, woodworking projects outside, and gets savaged by the mosquitoes in my backyard, it is a constant reminder of my deficiencies as a human being. We are not allowed to have fun anymore, uh, but we are allowed uh, to have Sam Moyne, before he starts fasting, uh, to talk about his new book, which is Ruffling Feathers. Uh, Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks. What a privilege. Sam, Sam is a Sam is a. Have you ever not ruffled feathers? In in the early days. Uh, in, the er, in the early days. Um, um, so I, one of the things I so just so so that you know, Sam, how many books have you written? It many. Right? I'd say four, I'd count four. You know, but there are a few like half books and you know the edited collections and that kind of thing. It, so uh, Sam is re absurdly um, uh, prolific, um, but the Sam, uh, just so people know, um, Sam uh, like made his big kind of splash, um, at least in terms of popular consciousness, when he wrote um, a book, um, which I bet people in the audience know, called um, uh, "The Last Utopia." Human rights and history is that the um, is that the, where um, where Sam um, basically uh, went after like the sacred cow of sacred cows, um, which is the human rights movement, um, uh, situated it historically um, uh, in the kind of the 1970s as a reaction to other failed types of progressive uh, movements and pissed everyone off um, uh, and got like the meanest. A review in the New York Times, which um, uh, also has somebody who's gotten one. Um, I think it, that now is a badge of honor. But I didn't this time. I yeah, got this two positive ones. So right, the, right. The, the, 
Right, right. But then the New Yorker would. Like, oh, of I, course, no, ripped yeah, to right, shreds right. elsewhere. But I'm right, just, right, yeah, you know, right. stating for. So, 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 you're. Um, I, I would, I would. Uh, I, could you, for the audience, like, um, state like sure. what your new book is about? Um, sure. Uh, titled uh, Humane. Right. So it's 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 a kind of long history um, that is. Uh, trying to explain a, a, a short-term event. And, you know, in this Zoom, I can say the short-term event is that Ben won. Uh, so after 2001, <laughs> he wrote a, a book called Law and the Long War. And right. it, it said we should have legalized counterterror of a new form, you know, until we don't need it. Um, and that was extremely controversial. Uh, but after some legal hijinks in the early Bush administration, uh, some conservatives um, kind of took Ben's advice. And then shockingly to some, Barack Obama took his advice. And what I try to study is how the call that kind of became so powerful in the Bush years um, to make the war compatible with international humanitarian law, humane standards, not just of detention, but as it turned out, killing, um, did, you know, what I see as unfortunate work in uh, giving ben, ben the win uh, for the present and future. And what I do is just set that in a long history of how Americans once stood at least sometimes for peace uh, and then became committed to endless brutal war um, before they ended up going through the post-2001 trajectory, which I just try to explain getting us now to this really interesting moment when, you know, we've had Afghan withdrawal, but a promise that that means continued or even intensified counterterror with, you know, um, some, some law in the mix there playing a really important role in how it's stabilized and maybe legitimated. So I have not read the book yet. Um, no worries. Uh, I, I will. Um, uh, and I mean to write about it when I do. But I, I want to situate your argument in what I think of as the previous contours of the debate. Um, and, and then ask you to reflect on the incredibly hostile reaction it has gotten from some quarters. So previously, there was a, this is a little bit crude, but I think only a little bit. Um, there was a debate between the left, which said, you can't do this stuff. The hard right, the, the, the Bush era early hard right, which said, you can do this stuff and you don't need a lot of authority to do it. And this stuff covers everything from surveillance authorities to targeted killing to, uh, in the case of the Bush administration, torture, uh, but most centrally detention and lethal force authorities. Um, and then there were people like me and Jack Goldsmith and Bobby Chesney and the sort of group of people who started Lawfare who said, you can do this stuff, but you need very specific authority to do it. And you need to get the three branches of government in roughly the same place in order to do it. And over, I would say, five or six years between the tail end of the Bush administration and the first half of the Obama administration, the executive branch really did that. And when you say that, sort of jokingly, that I won, I think what you mean is that, you know, that basic trajectory of getting the three branches of government onto uh, the same page happened and it happened in a fashion that was relatively permissive although with a lot of restrictions uh to uh the um uh to the that was permissive with respect to the ultimate war powers authorities 
And so my question to you is, first of all, is that a fair characterization of, of how you think of the history? But secondly, what separates you from the left? And you're part of the left. You are a man of the left. You're against the war on terror as people like me construe it. Why is it that you are, uh, well, welcome to write in lawfare, um, but uh, uh, the subject of a particularly vicious hit piece in Just Security, our, our kind of left brethren site? So I, I think your narrative is, is you know, correct, but I, I, I need to offer one big amendment, which is that it's true on one side of, of, of the ledger of, of the legal the legalization of war and not the other. That's to say it's true when it comes to conduct the, the of war, conduct but not of resort war, to force. Not the initiation or continuation of force where um, the legislature basically hasn't been involved, especially in continuation and indeed expansion and in the authorization of targeted killings in particular and of course the courts haven't been involved we can you know decide that that's a political question and a good thing that they're not involved but it's it that is really a story about if you like to not to coin a phrase the executive unbound um and what what all i want to do is take that story with the amendment and then say let's look at the way in which a very important moral claim has has played into the legitimation of endless war um, on the conduct of hostility side. And 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 I basically just read Barack Obama's speeches. You put on out an edition of them, you know, which some may forget. Um, with I think Ken I Anderson quote, and the anal an analysis here. of the of, of the speeches. Absolutely. So look at his Nobel speech. Look at his National Defense University speech four years later, defending drones in particular and targeted killings. And in both, you get a defense of, um, you know, no legal constraints on, you know, initiation and continuation of force. Um, although some kind of worry about endless war combined with assurance, moral reassurance, that the law governing the conduct of hostilities and making war humane, torture-free, with the minim with minimization of civilian casualties, makes it, you know, escape the moral turpitude of um, the way Republicans fight and neoconservatives, George W. Bush in particular. And so to me, this was of immense importance because there, that meant there's some audience for whom the assurances of humanity made it um, at least tolerable enough that it's still going on and indeed survives, you know, the first crude, heavy footprint form of the war on terror. Now, I, I did in, incur the wrath of the left kind of accidentally because I chose to illustrate one aspect of what I see as the tragedy of the initial years after September 11th, this human rights icon, Michael Ratner, basically saying he had no choice, but, you know, even though his anti-war priors were clear, he had no choice but to work on um, kind of detention and torture. Um, there, there was no way at that moment to raise kind of endless war as such as he had before and would under the Obama administration. And he and joined just, in and, a coalition. And, and just but, to be clear, the dispute here was, hey, there was an authorization to use military force. There was no way for him to challenge that realistically. But sure. there were these people that were being held under it uh, right. at Guantanamo right. whose plight he could fight for. And so you ended right. up in this situation where by representing the individuals uh, you arguably legitimized the premise. I think that's right, inadvertently, you know, and, and, and you could say, well, look, he'd, he'd engaged in fruitless lawsuits before, and he was always very concerned about the international law side, which, you know, 
in spite of the AUMFs is is debatable for Afghanistan and and extremely debatable for Iraq and targeted killings. Um, and you know the question is was there an opportunity cost or was there an inadvertent consequence? It's not like a a denunciation of the man, but because he's such an icon, I think my piece, which was spun off in the New York Review of Books, was read as as a kind of you know smashing of the idols. Um, where I just wanted to illustrate that on the left, also on the right, because I studied our friend Jack Goldsmith from the right in the same moment, there were choices made that lead to outcomes that are that the, those very principles might otherwise have rejected. Can, can, I, can, I, can I jump in for a second? So um, uh, I'm looking at r right now, uh, Joseph Raz, the great um, legal theorist, um, uh, probably the greatest legal theorist alive today, um, has it had uh, he wrote about this um, this phenomenon which he called the paradox of partial reform, which is that sometimes like you partial reform um, can make certain things worse, but in some ways better than others. Just that like sometimes you can like only get to a local maximum, but not get to the global maximum, right? And so you could think here that like, I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm definitely on the anti-interventionist side of this, of this, um, uh, of this debate. Um, and I would love for us to get to the, in my view, the, local, the global maximum of like not bombing countries um, uh, all the time. Um, uh, but like there is, it's not, it seems like I can get there, um, right. politically. So what I need to do, so now, like, it seems like, and this is what I'm just wondering whether, um, uh, you would agree that like, act, uh, legalizing and, um, constraining war in the way that has happened in the last um, uh, 10, 12 years um, is an, at least a local maximum. And it would be, be it's better that we're there than, you know, so we have three things, right? We have the minimum, which is brutal, awful war. We have the local maximum, which is, you know, humane war. And if you're like me or like you, we wish you were over here, but you can't get to there from here. So. Can maybe respond to that? Absolutely. And so I, I don't, I have no way of proving a counterfactual in which um, there, there would have been a better choice in the past. And frankly, I don't think in those years, even in once Abu Ghraib was revealed and, and there was some kind of national soul searching, I don't, I don't think that you could argue with the premise at, at, at that early date. Um, and so, again, it was noble to act in the way that Michael Ratner and, and many others did. And I'm not at all contesting that belief. Um, I do think, you know, that if, if it has the effect, however unintended, of legitimating an outcome that you might not like, that because you don't set the legal framework that results, Barack Obama does, then you, you've, you've unleashed a risk. And the question is, could we have controlled it better? Can we control it now? And is, is there some kind of more optimal uh, scenario? Um, and again, I, I'm not sure there, there was, I think there might be now that there's, there's, so, you know, so there's growing um, kind of a, a growing re-examination of the earlier choices, not just John Yu's memos about torture, but his memos about Afghanistan and Iraq. Again, our friend Jack Goldsmith, you know, proposed to OLC the other day that 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 it ripped those up too. Um, and you know, targeted killings, which I'm probably most disturbed by. Um, I think you know we've let a genie out of the bottle, and we. The more we think about it, the more we worry, you know, it, 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 it perpetuates terrorism rather than, um, 
kind of controlling it and I'll set scary precedents for other powers. I do think we can revisit, but no, I go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I, I would just say, say, can I, can I just ask this question bluntly? So there are two sure. ways of reading you. Okay. Yeah. One is to say, um, uh, you know, legalizing, um, war in the uh, it, conduct in war and making it more humane um, had unintended consequences but that's true of both views then one view says net negative the other one is net positive but there's still a lot to be morally upset about um, sure and which 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 is it so I, I'm going to I'm going to definitely embrace the latter and flirt with the former just because, you know, we could get into a very, you know, for some disgusting calculation of, well, how many people actually were in Guantanamo? How many were tortured as opposed to droned to death or visited, uh, you know, with fatal consequences by special forces? And it's now, you know, 15 years um, since this very brief outburst of of the worst kind of um, brutality and the moral you know panic if you like around it so I think it's a very tough calculation and of course if it goes on and on and we bake something into the world that all power other great powers including China building its own drones adopt well, the balance sheet becomes very murky then. And so I, I, I want to stick with like leaving that in suspense. It's a weak answer, but you know, I, I think answer. we haven't taken seriously the collateral risk of making wars more humane. And then there, there has to be an open debate and it has to be an ongoing one about whether the risks have become so costly that we need to revisit our past choices. So I want to... I, I mean, there's a lot that you're saying that I agree with, despite disagreeing with you about the core issue almost entirely. Right. Um, I think the debate about the core issue is um, uh, starts at a sufficient level of first principle that it's probably not that interesting. Uh, so. So I, I want to focus on. I'm sorry, uh, Ben. Can you actually say what the? Can you? I, I would because I would love to hear. The, can you say what the, like the core disagreement you would have, even if you're not going to adjudicate it now? Because I would love to hear. Uh, yeah. That. So I've, I've look. The core disagreement is, uh, is that, I think, by and large, that the, that, the counterterrorism on offense strategy. Uh, at a military level, to the extent that it was focused on counterterrorism as opposed to some other things that it got bogged down in, was immensely successful, um, protected the country over the course of 20 years. Um, and, um, and while I have deep regrets about aspects of the way it was conducted and collateral consequences of it, I have very little reservation about about the premise. And if you're going to do that stuff, which I believe in doing, um, uh, doing it in a fashion that mitigates collateral consequences, that makes sure you're targeting the people who really pose a threat, that, uh, you know, that makes sure when you detain people, you're not detaining the wrong people, that strikes me as a moral imperative. And so I am basically enthusiastic about the proposition that if you're gonna fight wars, um, you should do it in a humane fashion. So I don't see the, the I, I, I basically reject the, uh, the, the fundamental moral uh, uh, conundrum that Sam is positing. That said, um, I do think you're exactly right that conflating the resort to force questions and the use of force questions in particular with the, uh, with the 
uh, conduct of force questions uh, is a huge mistake. And that we have an opportunity now, we had an opportunity in 2001, which 90% of plus of the American population had no interest in thinking about. Um, but we have an opportunity now to think seriously about what the, what the proper role of use of force is in ongoing and future counterterrorism operations. And, um, and that strikes me as an opportunity that uh, people like you and me who don't necessarily agree about what the right answer was in 2001 and 2002, or the point on which I'm most emphatic, 2010 and 11, when I think we, when, when, when I am quite enthusiastic about the drone strikes that you are most anxious about. And I think those were like pivotal in destroying Al Qaeda. Um, there's a really good question today as to whether those disagreements from 10 years ago and 20 years ago presage fundamentally different attitudes today about what the proper role of the military and the covert action space is in future counterterrorism. And I don't think we would agree, but I think the scope of the disagreement would be less profound than it was 10 years ago. I think that's right. I'll just add, I mean, that's a beautiful rendition. Um, I'll just add that, you know, of course, there are many people, you know, and I'm sure many um, on this call who, you know, really opposed um, torture and other kind of detainee, uh, you know, abuse and, you know, process uh, um, kind of illegality, uh, you know, for intrinsic reasons on first principle. But I think a lot of people saw that this could advance their concerns about the Iraq war, which they may have mistakenly supported as such, or the war on terror as such. And and yet it didn't get posed frontally so, so that you and I and others could have that debate um, about the, the, the war itself and whether we, you know, want Congress to be more involved in authorizing it and so forth. So I would love to have a less distorted version of the debate. And I agree with you that so, the, the so, conditions are more propitious now. So can I propose an agenda for such a discussion? Because it, it seems to me there's a yawning question that the, the left, including the part of the left that you represent, has never seriously addressed, which is, so the, the, the right and the center in and the center left even in the, the Obama right. crew, right? Have an, have an answer to the problem of terrorist groups entrenched in ungoverned spaces. And the answer is, if the, if the host state can't deal with it or won't deal with it, you deal with it militarily. And it seems to me the left has never posed a viable alternative to that, um, which is, you know, what do you do about Al Qaeda entrenched in Afghanistan after 2001? What do you do about uh, uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula today or Al Shabaab in Somalia, where you don't have local government capacity? You don't have law enforcement people uh, with access, with arrest power, um, and you often don't have, although we've largely fixed this problem, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction for criminal law purposes. Um, and it seems to me that one of the great challenges, if we want to reduce the reliance on the military and on drones, is figuring out some alternative long arm proposals that actually reach that problem in a serious way. And I, um, uh, and I, I think that is 
like a question that we are in a position sort of for the first time since 2001 where we don't have forward deployed troops we don't have you know that we could actually think about what a what a proposed what a set of possible answers to that question looks like you know i i think that's right and it puts me in a difficult position because you know it, it, it's it's relatively easier to criticize um kind of the choices that were made than to present some alternative now of course a big part of my alternative would be the a, a partial denial that there's a problem to solve or as big a one as 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 you claim um and, and an insistence that there are a lot of other forces domestically especially that are leading to the perceived need to solve them uh and furthermore if if we take into account and do a kind of balancing exercise the kind of new problems we create through the strategy to face the alleged problem and the precedents we set for others I, it's very murky to me whether like the system is working, whether we um, wh whether we, we, we kind of need an a, 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 as as a, an answer to the challenge. But for sure, I, you know, I take a page from Scott's book and say, you know, our ancestors, you know, they they were fighting the last wars, you know, the world wars, and they tried to set up an international um, non-aggression regime. You know, and I talk about in the book how, you know, following Scott, that, you know, that the, the UN Charter was about that and the Nuremberg Trials was a, an, a, a trial of, uh, that was supposed to institute such a non-aggression regime, you know, normatively and, and legally. And I narrate how it that played in the Vietnam era um, and the kinds of legal debates, very different ones were had. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do think you're right that, you know, we, we need a global kind of governance solution um, and not one that licenses individual states just because they're powerful to ignore the non-aggression regime that, that, that even that those great powers once set up. And we don't have such an interdiction regime. Um, but it seems like a priority to like begin building rather than just taking it under our own recognizance to kind of solve whatever alleged problem there is. You. Ben, Ben. I think you're muted, you. Ben. Oh, sorry. I could not agree more, uh, not because I'm optimistic that this could actually be done, I'm, I'm not, but because I think any incremental progress you could make in building structure right. that could do it would relieve pressure on the drones. Right. And there are, drones are not a problem that, you, they're not an instrument that we so, use to solve problems where, you know, when there's a suspect in France, exactly. we don't send a drone, right? When there's a suspect in Saudi Arabia, we don't send a drone. Um, it's not even a pact among democracies. It's a it's it's an instrument of that we use in situations that are futile, um, and yet perceived as. And I grant you the 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 point that the degree of threat can be disputed. But there are situations that are perceived as urgent threats, and the more you can build capacity to deal with those by other means uh the uh, the less reliance you will have on that and i think we should take this opportunity to think about that question sure okay uh, so can i can i also say that i think um my my instinct is um i think to to uh, like uh, um kind of agreeing uh, more uh, with Sam that what, what the left, I think, needs to do is to push back on this idea that the $6 trillion that we spent um, on, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq and the, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who've been killed w was worth the costs um, that we um, that we've incurred and that we've imposed on other people 
um, for 20 years. I mean, it was a kind of a different thing with the shock of 9-11 um, to say we need to go out and get these people. But it's not obvious to to me that, the, you know, you know, like economists talk about the optimal amount of crime. Um, there just may be like terrorism cannot be completely snuffed out because it's a technique. Um, it's not a set of people. And the I, I've said this before, and, I, and I'll say again, like I, I we don't know why crime fell in the 1990s in New York City. Everyone's disagreeing. Why? How do we know that the that we've actually made things safer? Um, uh, and even if we did make things safer, um, it, it, it it just may not be six mil, six trillion dollars worth safer. And so, in in some sense, I think the kinds of debates that can be had um, could be like, um, do we want 20 more years of, of these wars? Like, were you happy with the last 20 years? Um, and I think that's a, that's a better, I mean, that, 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 that's a better argument that can be made rather than maybe we should create a multinational police force. Yeah, I, I, I'll just... I I actually want to take issue with that. Of course you do, because this um, is like um, I, this is a I, core disagreement. So I, uh, it was completely inevitable that we were going to take major military action in the wake of nine eleven. The oh, question the the question that was on the table, realistically, was how long were we going to continue taking major military action for? Um, and so the, the question then becomes, as every day that progresses, what are the alternatives to doing what we perceive we have to do militarily? And the absence of alternatives is pivotal to the, the continuation of the policy across administrations of quite diverse ideological preconceptions. And so my point is, if you don't address the absence of an alternative way. You have people in Yemen who are trying to build uh, uh, bombs that they can hide in people's butts. And they're, they're superb bomb makers. Um, uh, and this is a, uh, uh, a really, really significant threat because we actually don't know how to stop this. Um, and you have good intelligence about where they are, and so you hit them with a drone. Um, if you have an alternative to that, um, actually, even under the humane law that Sam is very critical of, uh, the, 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 the temporarily relaxed definition of imminence hinges on there being no alternative. Um, not on it being like about to happen like within four hours or something, but that this is the last window you have of opportunity to prevent it. And so my point is, if you do not build alternative mechanisms of, of prevention, um, and we've done some of it with the criminal law, which Bobby Chesney has documented very extensively, there's been a lot of work done there. It has civil liberties problems of its own, but it's, it, it's a very able thing. Um, if you don't deal with the ungoverned spaces problem, you will confront the situation in which I can describe it very precisely. The CIA has intel that something is in the works, and let's just say 70% of the time that intel is good. There's 30% that they're full of shit, but there's 70% there's of the time, they're right. And they know that this encampment in this ungoverned space where you have no ability to have your FBI league at at the embassy, call the local Mahabharata or, or the, you know, the police department and say, hey, there's something going down at these coordinates, can you help us? Uh, and what you do have is a drone base 300 miles away in friendly country that really doesn't want to be the target of that strike and is so 
just thrilled for you to use that as a base. You will use that. Yeah, I, I guess I, I and I want to obviously because this is Sam's um, show, so I want to. Or, or although he did call it, call it a call um, on this call, which I think is was very, it deserves retaliation. Yeah, yeah that that's they called a wild, it Zoom too. Right, right, exactly. I mean, that's like something Outrageous. that gets you in the book of the wild beasts. So whatever. Right. Um, but um, um, I guess there, you know, um, the 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 tricky. The tricky thing is, is that I think um, it is at, I wonder actually, but that it is politically not viable anymore to say, we're gonna go invade another country. Um, and so uh, like, I, 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 I wonder whether the real kind of source of disagreement here is just over kind of covert action and drone warfare, as opposed to something like what we did after 9/11, which was, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers invading um, um, Muslim countries. I feel like that's now considered um, um, like not a viable political option. I, actually, Sam, what I mean, I guess this. So, you know, so what, just what a think? few things. I mean, it's a great discussion. I, I so fundamentally, I can see Ben's point that you know, you need to proffer an alternative. I just would say in fairness that it took a very long time for not just the maximal response to 9-11, but for any alternative to like be, be um, to, for there to be the space to put such a thing on the table. Um, and, you know, what we were doing was, was kind of creating a situation of kind of path dependency and, and perceived inevitability um, that has been very difficult to, to shake. Um, I also agree with, with Scott that for the moment, kind of big footprint, heavy footprint war is off the table for political reasons, but none of the legal authority has been withdrawn. Uh, and, you know, history happens very fast. Um, yeah. I think, you know, Ben and I are divided within Barack Obama's mind. And I, I think with Scott, take the, the part of his mind that would tell Jeffrey Goldberg, this is a boring regulatory problem. More people die slipping in the bathtub or and way more die in America on the roads or from substandard health care, which the state doesn't fund, than from terrorism. And I wish I could educate people to understand that it's a, a, a boring regulatory risk that can't be eliminated. And then there's the other side, which even though he was the first of three successive presidents that ran selectively opposing wars, understood with George McGovern, you know, uh, back in the day uh, as a, a kind of big counterexample, that electoral disaster looms if you allow um, a you know uh, uh, if you allow a terrorist to strike uh, the homeland again and so th this has created some really bad incentives and i i think um i'd just like to you know push for just this broad discussion which you're su suggesting um about how inevitable counterterrorism is what 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 use it, it has, what risk we must accept, what precedence it's setting, what, what risk of the return of big wars uh, that we've, we've incurred through licensing a lot and never taking the permission for them back. So I uh, just want to make clear that I, have in, I am in no sense criticizing you for not having a fully developed Right. set of alternatives. Yeah, of course, of course. M my point is simply that in the long run, your position won't be viable I agree. for for politicians uh, I agree. in the absence of one. And I also think that the opportunity to create one has really only presented itself like the other day. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> and um, it's a uh, it, it's a it's an opportunity that we should seriously think about because it's it's 
you know, because the, the question of how you can be as enthusiastic as I am or as anxious as you are about uh, conduct of war rules as a humanitarian uh, development and still say you want to use war as rarely as humanly possible. And the question of how you can create the conditions in which you're doing that is something we should all be working on unless you're John Yu and you're just enthusiastic about war, right. um, which is a, like, that's a different pathology. Right. Dr. Doom, the floor is yours. Hi, simple question. Um, Sam, who are the people in rank order who have the most atoning to do starting tonight? Whoa, that is such a great question. And you're well, not allowed to include me on the on No, the of course list. not. I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, you know, I, company accepted. I think I've gotten in too much trouble for naming names. Uh, <laughs> although, in fairness, and, and Scott will respect this, it's only because I have this super ego that uh, that I think I created more than my editor did that required me to have characters um, in, in a book. We, 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 all about... have, we, we all have the same editor, by the way. Right, okay, so uh, yeah. I, I think I, 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 I should have, you know, um, I shouldn't have taken that part of the riot act so seriously, um, but I definitely have Michael Ratner and, uh, and others as, as main characters in the book, and I try to treat them fairly and respectfully um you know i'm not gonna i mean it, the principal point of the book is is that we, we, in a sense we've done david addington and john Yu and 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 you know george w bush himself to death uh and you know this this most recent kerfluffle over george bush's um you know failure to acknowledge how much he had done to set off some of the dynamics um that led to the present, it, you know, is, is, is pretty good evidence of that. Like, I, I'm not needed to pile on. And so I'm definitely trying to, if you like, own the libs uh, in, a, as usual. And it's really to point out, I mean, I'm really interested, I guess, in life and how good people end up colluding with bad things um, and what, what leads that to happen. So I definitely look back before 9-11, to uh, how uh, we got set up for what happened after. Um, and there I'm interested in not just the neoconservatives, but liberal internationalists who um, really did find lots of fancy new excuses to go to war and violate international law for doing so. And then, of course, I'm very interested in the human rights movements that have mostly, not Michael Ratner, but um, in the mainstream have abstained from the justice of intervention, except when they've approved humanitarian intervention, to focus narrowly on how um, American forces is, 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 is used abroad in its conduct. And then, of course, I'm interested in the lawyers under Obama, and that, you know, could include David Barron, uh, Harold Coe, Mar Marty Lederman, who I, I think are, you know, were in the situation they were in and, and chose and followed, you know, in kind of lots of, uh, of kind of imperatives to, um, uh, to reach the kind of continuities with the later Bush years that's been anticipated way back at the beginning. Um, and so I definitely give them some attention in the book too. But it's, I, 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 I'm not, it's funny because I got caught up in a kind of blame game, but it's the furthest from my intent because I think these are all honorable people who are making hard choices that from my armchair, you know, I don't kind of have the credibility to indict. I'm more interested in kind of collective public political discussion of where we go from here and whether we collectively got it wrong. I also think the the a lot of these people had legitimate alternative interests. So Michael Ratner had clients. Now, they were clients he'd never met at least at right. the beginning, but you know, as a lawyer who decides I'm representing, you know, Mr. Rasool, 
uh, you have an ethical obligation to make arguments that are in Rasul's interest, not arguments that are in the public interest. And Marty Lederman had a client who was President Barack Obama who wanted to, you know, didn't want to have heavy footprint war, but sure wanted to take out a lot of terrorists in the Fatah. Right. And, right. you know, and there are, like, I don't think it's an absolute defense of a lawyer to say, well, he had a client, but it is the case that once you actually have a client, it ethically constrains your ability to say, hey, wait a minute, the war is wrong, the problem is the war. For sure. Not later, though, and, and lawyers are people, too. And, you know, you can conclude that in spite of the necessary and right choices you made, you were party to a tragedy. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's what I'm arguing we should all do. Richard, the floor is yours. Hey. Um so I, I put three questions in there, and it was actually the one that was more tangentially related to the topic that got upvoted the most. But um, I'll ask that question. Maybe you can, uh, maybe Sam, you can uh, link it back in. But uh, the question is, um, so to what extent are national news organizations at fault for not keeping the continuation of armed hostilities in the forefront of public discourse, especially in the case of forever wars? And if memory serves, this is very different from the case during the Vietnam War. I mean, I, I remember from when I was a very young child, every night and every morning on the national news, the first story you saw was about the hostilities in Vietnam, the casualty counts and everything. Uh, and that's, we've seen very little of that in, you know, in the last 20 years. I think it's a great question. Um, I'm, and I, I don't dwell on it. Um, Actually, what I do dwell on is the presence in our war of m much more attention by journalists to the like legal questions that lawfare, at, at, you know, kind of was founded to debate and um, kind of Charlie Savage has been a, a national treasure um, in writing about those issues which really didn't make um, because they weren't debated much within government um, and there were no cause groups to press them in in the Vietnam era. Um, so it, in a sense, that's a point about like journalists kind of making something present in a novel way. But of course, you're right that it's a long, long, like a, it's an old phenomenon that great powers fight shadow wars that are hard to see. Um, and that some journalists do better than others. Um, in Vietnam, I think there was much less concern in the government about allowing journalists to be present than later. So that's a really, I mean, when I read Jonathan Shell's uh, classic, you know, pieces um, on Vietnam, I mean, what his minders allowed him to see and the brutality that he recorded, it, it just would, I think, perpetrated by Americans now, um, would, would, would not be easy. Um, and with drones, of course, um, very few journalists, even who went to cities in Afghanistan, got out into the rural areas where drones were most regularly striking. So you're making a, a, a hugely important point. It's not what my book's about because, you know, um, it's more about how we, we might sleep better at night, um, not just because out of sight, out of mind, but because the president's told us that it's all being done humanely. Christopher Argerus, the floor is yours. You have a bunch of questions. Uh, take your pick. I'll ask the second one, uh, which is, um, Sam, uh, what, what are the risks? Uh, this is a question that you pose on, uh, on your own podcast. What are the risks of reforms if we could have alternatives that could lead to better outcomes? Um, sorry, what are the risks of, of which I'm, I'm uh, g help me a little bit. Okay. Um, on your podcast, you were, you were talking about, um, uh, how things could, could, could change. Um, right, you know, right. How, how we change this, this current sort of, if you want to call it like the Obama moment that we're in. Got it. 
Got it. Um, and you you posed the question. You said, "What are the risks of reforms? If we could have alternatives, that could lead to better outcomes." Okay, great. So, look, I mean, this is a debate about、uh, alternative possibilities, and you know, Ben's made that very you know vivid for us. You know, let's choose a different arena just to clarify things. Right now, there's a big debate amongst activists about. You know how abolitionist to get, and how much to engage in harm reduction strategies instead when it comes to policing in prisons. And you know, I'm basically you know raising some of the same concerns that are now being raised in that domain about、um, about war, where you say, well, we we don't want to so prettify policing that our response to George Floyd is not less policing but more humane policing. Uh, alone, and same with mass incarceration. If we decide that you know we we should have less,、um, we should get there and not in in you know not incur the risk that more modest reforms could you know entrench something for good that we could end. But that's the sixty four million dollar question. Like, how far should we go?、Um, you know, should we should we take Kind of the the more proximate reforms that we can get soon, at, even at the risk of intr- making it harder for systemic reform later. I mean, that's just like a very boring but really important eternal debate, and and I'm just trying to initiate it in this one domain, but it's it's ubiquitous. Yeah, can I can I just as a marketing thing? Don't call it the sixty-four million dollar question. Call it the six point four trillion dollar. Of course,、question. that is the six. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Paula, you get the last question today.、Um, thank you. So my question is: Is、um, do you think that having better moral values, I would say, relatively than previous decades, centuries, makes endless war what it is, or makes kind of peace and war mutually exclusive? Because I think, like, I was thinking, like. Americans got a very small, and the political left got a very small feeling of what not having a democracy was like, and the political left here is rightly lighting itself on fire. I would, I would agree with that.、Um, I think you might have referenced this, and you're like touching on the justice of intervention. I think for someone who's more prone to that, recognizes that's what people in other countries go through on a daily basis. Does that lead us into? Wanting to go into more countries more often. I think that's very edgy, you know, and and because we do remember that、um, there was a lot of rhetoric in in the Trump years, but in response to January six in particular, that、um, that that expressed an anxiety in in an era of American hegemonic decline that we're we're becoming more like. Um, somewhere, somewhere else, where there's less governance, or less competent governance, or you know, fascism or tyranny, and I think it, it in a way, I mean, it, you're right that it could lead Americans to think m- more about w- what it's like to be one of the ungoverned spaces that Ben references, as if that's like an objective,、um, you know, fact about places abroad.、Um, But it it seems like a hard sell at this moment, especially if you're like on my side of those Trump era debates, and you think, well, you know, the taste was pretty small, and it 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 didn't lead to a kind of、um, abandonment of an American exceptionalism and an insight to you know what it's like to live elsewhere. Um, um, so I think we we may have to see some some more developments before. Um, Americans give up a pension to think they can offer help、uh, to those、uh, abroad through force of arms. We are going to leave it there. Sam Moyne, you're a great American. You're going to、Thank、be a、you. very hungry American. I will.、Um, uh, 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 and we will be back. Although I will not be back. Twenty.、Uh, uh, 20- Three hours and one minute from now, Scott. Who's going to be our guest tomorrow? Do you know? I don't actually. I don't actually know. So、um, Scott and Kate will figure it out. Yeah,、um, we'll figure it out sometime it, 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 between now and then. 
Um, everybody, uh, Mike Pesca has asked me to make an announcement um, uh, in relation to the poll. The part about his having been born in a car in his parents' driveway was true. Um, uh, so for those who voted in favor of Pesca's integrity on that point, you are correct. Uh, Scott, what do we say until 23 hours exactly from now? Yeah, we can't have fun anymore, but we can have the humanity of Sam Moy. And endless uh, war. <laughs> I don't want to say that. He says cheerfully. I, yeah, right, right. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, thank Sam. Thank you. For great to see me. you, Sam. Yeah, it's great. Bye-bye, everyone. Happy, uh, yeah, um, uh,